Hello, my name is Rolf Halden. Oh, sorry. Halden. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, hello, I'm Katie Cottingham, and we do have uh, Rolf Halden and Charles Rolski with us from the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. We are also coming to you from the American Chemical Society 256 National Meeting in Boston. And they're studying the environmental cost of contact lenses. So Dr. Halden. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I have with me here a doctoral student, uh, Charlie Rolski, and uh, also in the audience is uh, Varen Kelkar, another doctoral student in, of engineering. And our team tried to find out what happens to contact lenses, to particularly the flexible, new, daily disposable contact lenses after use. And uh, we, to our surprise, we found very little information about the fate of contact lenses in the literature, and so that motivated our study. What did we find? Well, it turns out that contact lenses after use take on a rather convoluted path. Um, we did an online survey of 400 people randomly selected that match about the demographics of users of contact lenses. And what we found out is that about one in five users disposes of the contact lenses by throwing them either into the bathroom sink or into the toilet. And from there, becoming part of wastewater, the contact lenses start a journey to the wastewater treatment plant. At the wastewater treatment plant, we found out through studies that were conducted at a real-world plant, full-size plant in the United States, that the contact lenses don't degrade. We tested 11 different types of um, contact lenses, and they all persisted for hours and days during um, placement in the treatment tanks, both under aerobic and anaerobic conditions, so uh, in the presence and in the absence of oxygen. Um, given that the contact lenses don't degrade in the treatment plant, they have only two ways out. One is through the effluent as treated wastewater, and the other one is um, becoming part of the sewage sludge, which is a byproduct of wastewater treatment. So we found that the polymers are heavier than water, they sink to the bottom, and the lenses that don't degrade become part of the sewage sludge. And uh, then from there, they have the option of either being incinerated, ending up in a landfill, or more likely, being applied on land together with sewage sludge. Um, this creates a problem because we know that plastic pollution is uh, already affecting both terrestrial and aquatic environments. In our studies, we confirmed the arrival of the contact lenses at the wastewater treatment plants through observations by operators. And we also were able to recover fragments of the contact lenses in sewage sludge. This means that the contact lenses um, actually fall apart. They don't degrade, they don't attenuate, but they become smaller. And so they create what we know as microplastic pollution, which is contaminating the oceans. And um, so these fragments are present in sewage sludge. The sludge is applied on land, and that uh, creates contamination of the soil environment. We know that earthworms take up soil and can ingest plastics, and then if birds eat the worms, it would create a pathway for the plastics to enter into the um, food chain. And uh, also, sludge applied on land is known to be subject to um, wash off, run off from heavy rainstorm events. And that can transport the sludge and the contaminants as well as the plastics into surface environments, into rivers, and the rivers emptying into the ocean can then you know, become contaminated with um, contact lens fragments from these disposable lenses. It sounds like a rather small problem because the lenses them themselves are tiny, but uh, they come um, by the billions and they are packaged also in polypropylene containers that have aluminum lids. So we um, did the mass math on uh, the quantities of mass that flow through the wastewater treatment plant end up on soils. And also the material that in principle could be recovered um, through recycling. And what we find is that there's billions of lenses ending up in US wastewater every year. They contribute a load of at least 20,000 kilograms per year of contact lenses. And then there's about 13,000 um, metric tons 
of polypropylene that are created as a waste stream from packaging contact lenses. This is equivalent to about um, 400 million toothbrushes, if you can't imagine what 13,000 kilo <laughs> metric tons look like. Um, and the uh, aluminum lids of the blister packs um, equiv are equivalent to about 90 million aluminum cans, if you would recycle that material. The unfortunate news is that the materials do not get recycled very effectively right now. We could identify only one manufacturer who has a take-back program, and most of the materials go into the landfills or into the trash, and uh, the materials don't get um, recycled. And so we describe here a very new form of plastic pollution because the polymers that make up contact lenses are unique. They differ from the plastics, the, you know, the um, PET bottles and other plastics that we are familiar with. It's a different type of chemistry and I think people have not looked for that. So I think our work should motivate researchers who study microplastic pollution to look for these particular polymers. And uh, there is a concern that plastics can make it into the food chain and so we're interested to find out how far these fragments of contact lenses travel and uh, how far we as scientists can influence consumers to not throw their contact lenses into the sink or toilet, but rather to put them into the solid waste stream and encourage the manufacturers to create effective recycling programs so that the consumer sees clearly and the environment stays clear as well as the food supply. Okay, and Charlie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I thought this was particularly interesting because we really looked extensively at you know short use plastics that aren't really of high value to us. We think about you know styrofoam, we think about straws and, and silverware and plastic bags, which are da dangerous threats to the environment. But you don't really think about plastics that people take so personally. And you know knowing people that utilize contact lenses on an everyday basis find them really vital for everyday function. You know whether it's a pilot, whether it's a doctor, people that really require eyesight to be clear and concise is something that's very personal to them. So I think this was really interesting in the, in the sense that it was a very personal, high-value plastic that, that people sort of take for granted and, and utilize every day of their lives. And uh, so I think that was a really interesting aspect of this study. And, and the, the more we can inform people about proper disposal strategies, even, even since beginning this project, people said, you know, I, have no, I had no idea that this was such a bad thing. I've been flushing for X years, and, and now I'm going to start throwing it in the trash. So you see incrementally that this starts to kind of change attitudes, and I think this is a really positive message at the end of the day. Great. Maybe one more um, comment. Uh, what was interesting to us is that people have a different relationship to contact lenses than to other types of plastics. They are made out of, so the contact lenses are made out of hydrogel, and they, they are kind of fluid. They feel like water, like, you know, they don't feel like a solid plastic. They don't feel like a waste. And people also who are, you know, environmentally conscious have nevertheless disposed of these lenses into the water environment because they just felt, you know, they, that they belong there. They do not. And it's interesting. We had a lot of media coverage and interest in, in this study. And uh, one reporter even, you know, admitted to throwing away the, the lenses into the, into the wastewater, into the trash, uh, and uh, mostly into the toilet. And uh, that uh, all friends are also doing that because it's just, it doesn't feel like a regular plastic. And so I think it's important that the message gets out that these are um, significant pollutants as we go through so many of these lenses. And we want to protect both the water and the terrestrial environment. Okay. Are there any questions? Please state your name and affiliation before asking your question. In the back. I'm Laura Cassidy with ACS. Would you expect that the plastics in contact lenses would break down more or less, less readily than other types of plastics? Um, I can take that. So <clears throat> there's a fundamental problem with the plastics we use today. The issue is that we have created almost an immortal material. It does not go away. It does not biodegrade. There are certain applications where this is desirable, where we want things to live as long as possible and then we recycle them. However, if you look at the landscape of plastic products, I would say that 99% of the uses are for uses that are non-essential, that go through a lot of volume and that create the eternal toothbrush, the eternal you know, toothpaste <laughs> tube and so forth. So this becomes a very long-term pollution. 
And uh, the polymers that make up these hydrogels that make up the contact lenses also are not designed for degradation. That makes sense because this is a medical device, right? So you don't want the lens to degrade in your eye, you know, impairing your vision and uh, potentially serving as a, you know, as a substrate for biofilm growth of bacteria. That's certainly not what you want. Um, but uh, I think as chemists, uh, this should encourage us to find a better balance between the useful life and the polluting afterlife of the products. And uh, I think it is time to you know, address this significant problem that we use plastics that are really old style chemistry. We have, way, we have outlived that, outlived by the numbers because we had too many people using these products. And we're creating a waste stream that becomes unmanageable. We see this in the oceans, we see this in land environments. You can see it at any walk along a river in the United States, anywhere you know, on the planet. And so um, this is just one indication that we need smarter polymers and we need them quickly. Okay, uh, be, uh, yeah, Bela and then Doug. Uh, Bela Buslig, ACS. Um, these plastics are, are, are the old fashioned, you know, polymers that, uh, that are really not degrading uh, environmentally. Uh, do you know, know or, or are you aware of anything, uh, anything that's using the, the biocompatible? Uh, polymers that uh, that are actually biodegradable, like polylactate, or, or there's a, uh, there's probably a, a, a huge number of uh, of polymers that would be very biocompatible, non-immunogenic, uh, 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 and uh, endocrine disrupting, and yeah. Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent question. So um, if the polymers we use for everyday products where we look at very large volumes, if we have alternatives, you know, do we and why don't we use them? So these are, these are good questions. I think the answer is, are there alternatives to the plastics that make up most of the plastic uses today? I would say, yes, there are. Um, those, the desirable alternative would be made out of uh, um, renewable resource Right, rather than fossil fuel, and it would degrade if it escapes into the environment after a given period of time. Not instantaneously, but you know, within a reasonable time span. We have to see that the plastic products we produce today last for hundreds of thousands of years. And so I think that the situation right now is that in the laboratory, you know, in the ivory tile of academia and some industrial you know, research labs, we have alternatives. But we also have produced a culture of people being used to you know, going through large amounts of material, not asking questions. And uh, we have created a production pipeline that is not necessarily easily to convert into these biodegradable plastics. So a, an investment will be needed in order to change the way we, you know, the types of polymers we produce. So I think we have alternatives, but it is a, a little bit of a painful process to convert to that. And we overuse polymers. We really, you know, we we have had been become complacent in using so much material. At a small scale, this all works and it's fine, but you know, given that we have over seven billion people on this planet, we just cannot continue to use these types of plastics. Well, my, my background on this particular thing is uh, the majority of, of uh, contact lenses are, are nowadays are, are the dis disposable type. And, and if you are really going into the disposable, start with something that, uh, that, that's readily degradable and disposable. I mean, uh, uh, the food packaging industry is, is way, way ahead of these people. people and uh, all they're doing is, is, is replacing one, uh, one polymer with another one rather than, uh, than retooling or redoing everything. The two, two is pr are pretty much the same. Yeah, I, uh, I agree. So the, the comment here is we, we have alternatives. Why aren't we putting them in? And I think what's important is that we have, for the contact lenses, these are medical devices. And it's essential that they function and keep the person safe. So if, they, you know, if they would uh, provide a good surface for bacterial growth, that would be detrimental to the eye and would cost potentially people's you know, eyesight. So for medical devices, I think there's probably a different standard, different expectations. And also, because it's a high value use, we, I think we could create a very effective capture uh, route 
of, of using this. But for other products like water bottles, you know, that are sold by, uh, by the millions a day around the globe, um, those we don't have good track, on, you know, we don't keep track of them. <laughs> Um, and uh, and so for those we definitely need uh, alternative polymers. So I completely agree with your assessment, and I think the time is is, uh, is right to make some changes and encourage the you know educate the consumer, but also encourage industry and academia to do more. And so we try to do our part. It's a group effort. Okay, Doug. Doug Dallamore, American Chemical Society. Um, I, I came in a bit late, but I'm not, I'm not sure if you addressed this, but. Uh, what sparked this area of research? Um, it, it, it doesn't seem, uh, well, it's a, it seems like an out of the box kind of way of looking at plastics because we don't seem to tend to think of, of contact lens, lenses as a plastic or a pollutant. Uh, yeah, Charlie, you want to take that? Yeah, <laughs> I think this was one of many interesting brainstorming sessions that we've had in Rolf's office where We've kind of just been spitballing ideas back and forth, and I think one day maybe Rolf had a particularly bad time with one of his contacts because he kind of leaned back in his chair and said, you know, I wonder what happens to these things. They, they're so flimsy, and, and you can lose them quite easily, and, you know, if you take them out, then your vision obviously then kind of goes fuzzy, and then you can lose it then too. So he even mentioned maybe by accident it could end up going down the drain, even if it's not on purpose. So we started kind of running with it, and all of a sudden when you started, you know, adding up the numbers, we cut, we it was kind of a moment of realization. Because like you said, it's a very small thing. It, you, know, you don't really associate it with a big type of pollution. But as soon as we started to add up and sort of you know, the survey, uh, the experiment in the wastewater treatment plant, then it started to present a really big issue. And even underlying this, it's not only about small things becoming big. It's just what happens when you dispose of something improperly. You know, that, that's going to go somewhere and, and, and possibly be quite hazardous. But it, it came definitely in kind of a funny moment of Ideas in, in a way, it's ironic because we seem to have hit a nerve with the attention of people. They, they're really fascinated by this. If you look at the volume, this is a very minor use of plastics in society. <laughs> There's, you know, very, you know, a lot of high volume uses that present great problems. Here we get a, a great value, so to speak, for a small amount of plastic. Um, but somehow we got the attention. We want to, you know, divert that attention of the consumer to two things. First of all, don't put those lenses into wastewater, put them into the solid waste or recycle them. And secondly, as, you know, as happy as you are about plastics, think about what plastics you really need and if you can find other alternative materials you know, and uh, buy those to send a signal you know, with your wallet that uh, you are, like to protect yourself, your food supply you know, and the environment by having safer products. And I think it also is, you know, this might have been a different experiment had there been labeling on a lot of these boxes, you know, sort of specifying maybe dispose of these with solid waste and please avoid having them go down a drain. Maybe it would have been a different story. So I think that could help too. So have you actually reached out to companies to get them to change that labeling? Well, we are, we are here right now, and so we, the, the journey has begun in that direction. And I, I hope that uh, people will contact us, and uh, we'll be happy to you know, start a dialogue. We'd be happy to help. Um, I'm sure we will begin to look for these types of polymers in the environment uh, that could motivate more studies and, and create maybe more urgency uh, to really look into this. Uh, one thing that we didn't mention is that the plastics that become part of the water environment, they tend to absorb chemistry the air pollutants and the water pollutants that are already there, they're typically somewhat diluted, um, but the, the plastics can absorb large quantities of these and really up concentrate them by orders of magnitude. So you, know, you might not care about microplastics, but you've heard of dioxins, you've heard of PCBs, you've heard of endocrine disruption and effects that you know, uh, diminish uh, your health and that affect the behavior and the development of our children. And so it's important uh, that we reduce both these uh, other pollutants, which we call secondary pollutants when we talk about plastics, but also to decrease the amount of uh, plastic rafts that are out there collecting toxins on a daily basis and you know by the billions or trillions of pieces in the ocean and in the terrestrial environments. Okay. And if there are no other questions, then um, thank you for joining us. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Boston 2018. 
Please join us for our next press conference at 1030 today on how strawberries could help reduce harmful inflammation of the colon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.